Imagine this, you're in Japan on March 11, 2011, just having a regular day when you suddenly experience the jolt of a 9.1 magnitude earthquake and witness a tsunami approaching from the window just a few minutes later. No, this isn't a scene from some high-budget Hollywood thriller. It's real life. This one natural disaster acted as a catalyst for Japan to undertake its biggest, most challenging project ever, the Tsunami Great Wall. Natural disasters like earthquakes and small to medium floods have always been a regular occurrence in Japan. If we were to calculate, Japan experiences nearly 4,000 small earthquakes and around 1,000 medium to large magnitude earthquakes per year. This means some zones and areas might even experience several earthquakes per day, which is mind-boggling if you think about it. However, the earthquakes alone can still be dealt with and recovered from quickly. The real nightmare begins when the four massive tectonic plates that Japan sits on begin to show movement and large water bodies shake up. These tectonic plates shift and grind against the Earth's crust deep underneath the ocean floor, causing the seabed to rise beyond a safe, manageable level, and turning massive waves into tsunamis that wipe out tens of thousands of lives in just a few moments. Latest data suggests that the tragic 2011 tsunami took nearly 20,000 lives and left Japan in a state of complete destruction and despair. Homes collapsed, innocents drowned, and all of Kamaishi and Fukushima's infrastructure was swept away in no more than a day. While it is rare for earthquakes and tsunamis to surface together like this, nature isn't known to be very merciful even to the luckiest mortal being. Because of Japan's poor positioning and geography, the combination of the two natural disasters unfolding together is always a deadly one, taking away more lives in one go than any illness or outbreak ever could. Following the Tohoku tsunami, Japan decided to confront the problem directly and prevent it from becoming a threat to its survival and future generations. It was a necessary step and one that would protect the people, infrastructure, and economy of Japan for centuries to come. The plan was to build enormous tsunami defense walls around a 400-kilometer area, with the height of these walls reaching up to 50 feet to prevent any future tsunami, no matter how large, from knocking them down. Even if the walls don't hold the water out forever, in case of a tsunami, they can at least stall the floods long enough for people to reach elevated hilly areas and keep themselves and their loved ones safe. That said, the plan wasn't as easy to execute as it might sound, and many hurdles and challenges were faced along the way that made the plan more difficult to materialize. Like any other large-scale project, work began with conducting studies and research. The Japanese government had sworn that no matter what happens, a tsunami like 2011 cannot return and destroy Japan as it did before. Staying true to their intention, they had the initial plan for the seawall laid out by the end of 2012 and began the work right after. This plan involved building enormous 50-foot walls that spanned across the northeastern coast of Japan, where the sea level had the tendency to rise often. Most of their working and data for this plan came from the tragic disaster of 2011, and no matter how devastating the period was, it forced Japan to get its guard up and build a defense mechanism that would protect it from future disasters. During the research phase, scientists and engineers essentially recreated the 2011 waves in small artificial wave tanks to get a concrete idea of what exactly it would take to build a structure that would stop such a powerful flow of water. Different extreme case scenarios were worked on as well to have a margin of safety in case a worse tsunami rose. After all the studies and research were complete, now it was time to figure out the ideal location to build the tsunami wall. The plans are practically useless if Japan doesn't set up the structure in the right places where future tsunamis have a higher chance of hitting. The nearly 400-kilometer area around the northeastern coast of Japan, near cities like Sendai, Miyagi, and Fukushima, was finalized since the 2011 tsunami affected these areas the most. Next, these coastal areas needed to be cleared and flattened to be able to lay a foundation for the wall within them. Work began with demolishing already ruined infrastructure and clearing sites that needed to be cleared for the foundations to be laid. This obviously took some time since there was a lot of private and public property here. 
Once the land was cleared, long roads and connection routes were built for resources to come in smoothly through trucks and large commercial vehicles. Multiple power lines, energy sources, concrete mixing stations, and whole new drainage systems were built across the targeted 400-kilometer land to fulfill basic infrastructure development needs. This clearly wasn't going to be a quick one-and-done project. There were multiple steps and stages throughout the entire execution process, and laying a basic foundation on the land was obviously only the first phase. The northeastern coast, or the Tohoku region, sat on uneven, loose sand, and it would be impossible to build a strong, sturdy tsunami wall on unfavorable land like this. The ground was remodeled entirely and given a new base built using a mixture of steel, crushed stone, and compacted sand. It was crucial to have stability and sturdiness in the base here, or else the seawall would be good for nothing and would come crumbling down in case of another massive tsunami. Excavators and various heavy drilling machines were used to dig 60 to 70 foot deep pits in the ground that gave the seawall the support and sturdiness it needed. These deep pits were filled with dense concrete and steel to give the base of the wall a solid foundation that will keep it from cracking or eroding under immense pressure from the waves. The priority when setting up this structure was to create an extremely heavy and wide base that wouldn't be affected by the strong movement of the water. Massive concrete blocks, typically 30 to 50 feet long, were created using molds and then connected methodically to build an immovable barrier that stretched 4,000 kilometers along the coastline of Japan. Special energy-dissipating blocks and slabs made of concrete were also placed at the base of the ocean-facing side of the wall to absorb strong wave hits and displace the energy before it has a chance to crack the structure. Although this last part sounds like a very minor precautionary measure, when a tsunami breaks out and waves are crashing against the wall at several hundred kilometers per hour, it makes a massive difference. In regions that received heavy rainfall, a dense formation of crushed rocks and sand was set up in addition to a proper drainage route to keep any rainwater from pooling on the other side of the wall. This was a genius step as it ensured that the rainwater wouldn't get trapped behind the wall and cause flooding in the inner city areas. That being said, not every zone on the northeastern front of Japan had the wall built the exact same way. The sea level and environmental factors of each region had to be considered in order to build a wall that would protect Japan for centuries to come. Some minor tweaks and changes were made in every region to construct the strongest possible tsunami barrier. In some northeastern fronts, where the current was stronger and the sea level was higher, large concrete blocks were added on the surface of the wall for additional thickness and resilience. This further helped reduce the erosion impact from the strong water movement. Think of this extra layer of concrete blocks as further armoring an already armored vehicle to keep even heavier artillery out. Now, you might be thinking, what about the coastal ports? Well, Japanese engineers and designers had a plan for the ports, too. Busier ports, like the Iwaki port, have this gate inside the wall that operates using a hydraulic pressure system. When large ships, fleet carriers, or cargoes have to enter, this top-down gate opens and lets them in. However, as soon as nationwide warnings about floods or a possible tsunami are issued, these gates will close to keep the tsunami out and keep the coastal areas safe. Other ports, however, may use a sea gate that lies flat on the sea floor, allowing for ships to navigate the sea freely. But in case of a tsunami warning, the hydraulic system lifts the gate from the sea floor and raises it in a way that blocks the tsunami from entering the coastal areas. This is obviously a highly specialized mechanism that is created using the highest quality erosion resistant materials. Now that we're through with the construction phase of the largest coastal defense project in Japan, let's quickly discuss numbers to gain a perspective of how much these large-scale infrastructure developments actually cost. Studies reveal that Japan has spent roughly $13 billion on this project till now. And although that might sound like a major cash outflow, it has created thousands of jobs, brought new opportunities, prevented property damage, and made Japan considerably safer for its people. The average Japanese resident doesn't have to live in constant fear and anxiety of an incoming tsunami washing away his home anymore. And that, in and of itself, is worth everything. 
Various studies show that, in general, a 10-meter increase in seawall height is correlated with a 5% to 6% decrease in tsunami damage. Using this rough estimate, we can assume that Japan is at a 50% to 60% lower risk of experiencing major destruction from a tsunami compared to before it had built the coastal barrier. This is huge progress, considering they've achieved this in just 10 years. Keep in mind, however, that the project is not fully complete and some areas are still undergoing minor changes and reconstruction. Now you might wonder, what if the barrier cannot hold the tsunami back? I mean, it's only a matter of time before repeated tsunamis erode the concrete structure enough to break through it, right? Well, in that case, the barrier still does its job of protecting the northeastern zones of Japan by buying people a few precious minutes they need to reach a hill or some sort of elevation. The chances of the wall tumbling down are obviously very slim, but even if that does happen, it's still better than nothing. Since the completion of this massive project, the number of deaths from tsunamis has drastically reduced, and the people of Japan, especially those who reside near coastal areas, do not have to fear for their lives and property anymore. They place trust in the government because the system has built an entirely new infrastructure to protect them and their loved ones. When governments prioritize people, people place more faith in the system. Despite this being Japan's largest and most expensive infrastructure development project yet, the country is known for successfully undertaking many other notable projects as well. Japan's genius planning and hiring of capable geotechnical specialists for research work has almost always paid off. While I personally believe that it's due to the proper recruitment and leveraging of the right resources, many think it's in the Japanese blood to build massive structures with purpose and execute large-scale projects to perfection with ease. If there's one thing Japan should be proud of, it's this. You might have heard about Japan's underwater tunnels. Engineering crews especially designed them to stretch across several hundred kilometers underground and play a vital role in the country's transportation system. This project is one of a kind, and it swiftly interconnects a vast network of different islands, ports, and sea zones to ensure seamless transport of resources in and out of Japan. The unique flexibility and flow these underwater tunnels provide will pleasantly surprise you. That said, the underwater tunnels are also open for public use and provide an undisturbed, seamless route to different coastal regions in Japan. Many of these tunnels even have train networks built inside them for public transport or the transportation of goods across the country. The tunnels were specially engineered underground to provide a safe passageway in case of rough weather conditions, but for many, this route might even be a faster one since traffic isn't that big of a concern here. These tunnels clearly weren't easy to design or build. The plans were first laid out in the early 1900s, with serious development beginning mid-century. Large-scale feasibility studies were conducted right after World War II in an effort to lift Japan from the ashes of the war. Architects, geological specialists, and engineering crews spent day and night researching and mapping out detailed designs of the tunnels. To no surprise, they didn't disappoint. The first big concern in the execution of the plans came from the fact that an underwater environment is difficult to work in and even more challenging to navigate around with important resources. Many questions arose in the initial phase of the project, but Japan's capable engineers quickly demonstrated that they shouldn't be taken lightly. Their extensive land surveys, structural design plans, and determination just screamed, all is handled. The first phase of this underwater tunnel project involved taking a comprehensive look at the sea structure through geological surveys and seismic studies. This was done to determine whether construction would be hindered because of natural roadblocks and to figure out possible challenges that would require altering the original plan. It's pretty much impossible to have control over a free-flowing variable like the sea, so their best bet was to identify possible challenges and hazards and find ways to work around them effectively. One of the biggest hurdles when undertaking an underwater project like this is the possible impact it can have on marine life sea creatures and their natural habitats are obviously disturbed during the whole construction process, but thorough marine ecosystem studies were conducted early on to ensure precious sea creatures aren't distressed while the work takes place. 
big and small fish species, as well as other sea creatures and plants were considered before making any big underwater moves. Special measures were put in place to limit noise pollution underwater while construction takes place, and different artificial reef formations were carefully placed deep inside to give the sea creatures a sense of safety and belonging in the space. To construct the massive underwater tunnel system, the immersed tube method was employed. To put it in simple words, this method involves building several hundred meter long concrete tunnel blocks on land and then fitting them all together underwater, almost like Lego blocks. It's easier said than done, and takes engineering crews years to get the structural design of all the pieces right. Typically, each massive concrete block has two wide openings for roads, two for the train system, and one more opening for tunnel maintenance. When all the blocks are connected together, the uniformity of the passageway is extremely satisfying to look at. When connecting all of the blocks for the tunnel, the biggest hurdle is often connecting them precisely enough not to let any water in. If even the slightest gap lets water in, the tunnels would be flooded in no time, and it would be another 2011 all over again. This is where proper planning comes in clutch, with the right execution to achieve results that stand for centuries on end. Thin gaps in between the blocks are filled with rubber to ensure a complete watertight tunnel system, and a thick layer of sand and crushed rocks is placed above the tunnel to keep the water pressure from affecting the overall structural integrity. It goes without saying that underwater tunnels cannot be built anywhere and everywhere. One of the most common methods for building them, the immersed tube method, isn't really suitable for unstable underwater environments where currents are strong and overall turbulence is high. Joining several hundred meter long concrete blocks and expecting them not to erode with the extreme water pressure would be incredibly irrational. It will put lives at risk, and the overall safety of the tunnel infrastructure will remain compromised forever. The Sei Khan and Khan Mon underwater tunnels were carefully and strategically built in narrow sea passages where the water pressure is mostly tame and the sea terrain is much simpler to navigate. After completion of the construction phase, the next phase involves safety surveys and checking operational capabilities. The tunnels cannot be opened for public use without a proper safety inspection. To carry out the assessments, engineering and specialized construction crews conduct a series of meticulous tests to rule out possible problems with waterproofing, pressure sensitivity, electrical or fire systems, and overall structural integrity of the tunnels. Once all the possible hazards are tested for, the tunnels are declared open for use. However, the testing phase isn't over yet. In the first few weeks of the tunnel being available for public use, everything is carefully assessed with eagle eyes. Studies are still being conducted, and research is still ongoing on how the tunnel handles the new traffic movement. It's a testament to how dedicated Japan is to the safety and livelihood of its people. While most national-level projects are abandoned halfway or never followed up with once they're completed, Japan's underwater tunnels are extremely well-maintained and receive frequent maintenance checks to ensure public and infrastructure safety. Studies are still being conducted on how the tunnel system can be improved and made safer. Technical crews and maintenance teams work on the tunnels regularly to ensure there are no signs of weakness in the structure or possible seepage that might let water in. To make maintenance even more efficient, engineers have installed hundreds of automated sensors across the tunnel to be immediately notified in case of a possible hazard or even the slightest structural damage. Everything from temperature, pressure, wind speed, and vehicle speed is being constantly monitored inside the tunnel. If a problem is detected, specialized crews arrive on the scene immediately, shut down the affected part of the tunnel temporarily, and don't leave until the issue is fixed and complete safety is restored. 